As humans fight for control over the Fae, the creatures are forced out of their homes and seek refuge on human territory, unaware of a greater evil waiting for them. After discovering their existence, nations fought to control the riches in the homeland of the Fae. The Republic of the Burg eventually withdrew, thus leaving the Fae folk to their rivals, the Pact. Under their rule, the Fae's homeland becomes hell and its residents struggle to escape. Seven years later, several fairies run from the soldiers of the Pact, who use beasts known as Maroks. One fairy trips and is nearly attacked by a Marok when Vignette Stone Moss holds the beast down and kills it. Despite this, all fairies get shot down, so Vignette, the lone survivor, flies onto a ship to escape. The captain refuses to let her board, reminding her that she's their last Sparrowhawk who finds and recruits refugees to pay for passage through their ship. Persistent, Vignette stands her ground as she can no longer stay in her homeland. Cannons are suddenly shot in their direction, so the captain relents and allows Vignette to hide in the hold. Before entering, a crew member tosses her matches from the Tetterby Hotel. At night, the ship travels through a storm. During this, Vignette looks at a man's photo until another refugee thanks her for arranging passage for them. Vignette reminds her that they still have to pay, otherwise they must work in the Berg. Still, the woman believes they have a better chance in life there. She then notices the photo, recognizing the man's uniform as a Burgish soldier's. The woman asks if he's the reason Vignette is heading to the Berg, but she reveals that the man died during the war. Suddenly, the ship breaks, sending water inside and forcing the refugees to struggle for their lives. In the Berg, the man in Vignette's photo, Inspector Rycroft Philo Philostrate, arrives. The city is full of various creatures, including humans, fairies, centaurs, and fauns. Philo visits Unseelie Jack's latest victim, Magret. Unseelie Jack is known to attack the Critch, a derogatory term used for fairies. Despite the woman's distrust of authority, Philo insists on learning more about her attacker, promising to get her justice. He notes that Unseelie Jack attacks every three weeks, and since it's been three weeks since Magret was targeted, another victim will suffer soon. With that in mind, Magret recounts how the man claimed that he could smell the darkness on her. He had mutton chops and a snake tattoo on his arm. He also wore a uniform, but Magret doesn't know what kind. Elsewhere, the refugee's shipwreck is found, and Vignette is among those on the shore. At the Balefire Hall, Ritter Longerbane insists the Critch are infecting their city with vices, wantonness, and worship of strange gods. He convinces the parliament that they threaten their people and blames Chancellor Absalom Breakspear for doing nothing. The Chancellor reminds the assembly that the Fae were forced out of their lands because Longerbane's party surrendered them to the pact. Still, Longerbane insists the Chancellor decided to partake in the war. As they put a vote on how to deal with the creatures, Longerbane quietly insinuates that the Chancellor is biased as he's consorting with Pix Harlots. This angers Absalom, making him rant at home. When his wife, Piety, asks about it, he dismisses her concerns. The two then notice their son, Jonah, who's just arriving home. His mother confronts him, asking if he'd been to Carnival Row, the slums where most Fae end up. Jonah assures her that he hasn't, so she reminds him that he can't give his father's enemies any ammunition. Elsewhere, Tourmaline meets Philo on the streets, so she asks him about his progress. The inspector complains that he'd have caught on Sealy Jack if the other victims gave their statements, though Tourmaline reminds him that fairies aren't comfortable with humans barging into their homes. Philo argues that he's not the pact, but Tourmaline points out that many officers surrender the fairies to the enemy. Meanwhile, officers interrogate Vignette, the only survivor of the shipwreck. She recounts how the crew wouldn't let them out of the hold despite it getting flooded, but the officers defend that it's to prevent them from escaping and leaving the crew with no payment. Soon, Ezra Spurn Rose is taken to the station as he owns the ship that delivered the refugees. He defends that he merely invested in the ship to charge the ferries for passage. The officers confirm that it isn't illegal, though they complain that there are too many ferries in the city already. Since Vignette didn't pay, Ezra decides to keep her as his sister's maid so she can work for her fee. As the fairy begins her duty, Ezra's sister, Imogen, checks on the fairy and touches her braid. Vignette flinches, excusing that the braid is all she has left of someone she lost. Later in the streets, Burgish men rally against the Fae folk. Philo attends to see anyone who matches Magret's description. When he finds Sergeant Dombey, he confronts him and demands to check his arm for the tattoo, which the man refuses. When the officer questions why he's protecting the fairies, the inspector recounts how he fought beside them in the war. Hearing this, Dombey mentions a rumor that Philo fooled around with the fairy, leading the man to punch him. That evening, Philo returns home and shares a passionate evening with his landlady, Portia. The following day, the Spurnrose housekeeping fawn, Afisa, straps Vignette's wings down to keep her from escaping. 
the fairy asks about the Deterby Hotel, where her friend might be staying, but Afisa comments that the place is of ill repute on Carnival Row. Afisa asserts that she's living a decent life serving the Spurn Roses, so Vignette shouldn't risk that. Later, while cleaning Imogen's bathroom, Vignette comes up with a plan and pours her perfume down the drain. This causes the lady to send the fairy away to refill the bottle. Vignette uses this chance to go to Tetterby Hotel to meet with Tourmaline, having paid a ship crew to track her down. Tourmaline is ashamed that she now works at a brothel, unlike Vignette, who led refugees to the Berg. The woman, however, doesn't see it as heroism as they still end up as servants in the city, but Tourmaline knows it was her way to help. As she comforts her friend, Tourmaline notices Vignette's braid, which marks her as a widow. Hesitantly, she reveals that Philo is actually alive. Meanwhile, Philo reports to Magistrate Flute about his suspicion on Dombey. He asserts that Unseelie Jack could attack an innocent fairy at any moment, so he wants to put Dombey under surveillance. The Magistrate refuses, ordering the Inspector to clear his head. Exiting the office, Philo meets with Constable Berwick. Berwick notices many sailors in the station, as a ship keeps bringing them in, half mad, every three weeks. Hearing this, Philo realizes that Unseelie Jack is a sailor, not an officer. At the hotel, Vignette is pissed, thinking that Philo abandoned her after taking what he wanted. This urges her to ensure that Philo knows how she feels. Meanwhile, Imogen sees that their new rich neighbor has arrived, so she hurries to meet him. Worried that she'll embarrass herself, Ezra goes with her. Finally, they meet their neighbor, who, to their surprise, is a wealthy fawn named Agrius. That evening, Jonah visits the Tetterby Hotel and pays for Tourmaline's services. However, he gets abducted while Tourmaline is asleep. Meanwhile, Philo and Berwick head to a saloon to observe the sailors. The inspector notices an angry sailor with mutton chops, so he pretends to be drunk and spills a drink on the man. This allows him to get close and see a snake tattoo, identifying him as Jack. Immediately, the man runs for it, so Philo and Berwick split up to catch him. The inspector follows him up a scaffolding and across several buildings. Eventually, he corners Jack, aiming a gun at him. The man claims that he had to stop the Critch's evil, as they're not God's children. He claims that they came from a dark place and brought something that would end them. Jack warns the inspector that some dark god wakes before throwing himself off the roof. Meanwhile, as everyone else is asleep, Vignette discreetly takes a knife from the kitchen and releases her wings. She cuts her braid before flying off through the window. Philo returns to his room and finds Portia already on his bed. Noticing his wounds, she suggests going to the doctor, but the inspector refuses. His landlady urges him to talk, tired of him not opening up to her despite their relationship. Still, Philo refuses, so the woman leaves, convinced that she's no more than entertainment to him. Later, Vignette finds Philo asleep and immediately puts a knife to his throat. She demands an explanation, and the man admits that he faked his death, though he assures her that he didn't mean to hurt her. Tearfully, Vignette claims that he destroyed her as she waited in grief for seven years. Despite this, the fairy can't bring herself to kill him, so she flies away. Elsewhere, a fairy named Ashling Corell gathers items from the river, unaware of a creature lurking in the sewer tunnel nearby. She also finds Philo's photo that Vignette lost before the creature attacks. The next morning, Philo apologizes to Portia for how he's treated her. Portia figures out that he's keeping people at arm's length because of a lost love. He doesn't deny this, but doesn't explain it further. At the South Bank, people are horrified to find Ashling's body. Philo arrives and suspects that she was killed recently, and the killer dragged her into the nearby tunnel. Berwick shares that Ashling used to be a famous singer, so Philo orders his comrade to look into her records. The two soon visit Ashling's home, where they find Runyon Millworthy hiding in the closet. He explains that Ashling was his friend and that he had just arrived in the Berg earlier. He needed a place to stay, so he visited Ashling but didn't find her home. He only hid after he heard the officers arriving. Runyon shares that he was a performer like Ashling. He plays one of Ashling's vinyl records, recounting how she used to be a star that attracted the rich and powerful. However, she mysteriously fell out of the spotlight and became a recluse. Runyon claims that he last saw her years ago, insisting that he didn't kill her. Despite this, Philo declares that he's a suspect. Runyon scoffs, knowing that the police don't care about fairies, but Philo insists on finding whoever killed Ashling. At the crossings, Afisa confronts Vignette about sneaking out last night. The fairy begs her not to tell the Spurn Roses, explaining that she had just visited someone she knew, though she never wants to see that person again. Convinced, Afisa carries on with her tasks. The Spurn Roses call upon Solicitor Wigsby to report that a fawn has moved into their neighborhood. Imogen calls Agrius a puck, a derogatory term for fawns which Afisa overhears. The lady even calls it ridiculous that Agrius has a human servant and Wigsby sympathizes with her. 
However, there's no law against the fawn owning such property, so a pissed emotion decides to ignore their new neighbor. Meanwhile, Tourmaline wakes up to Jonah's servant knocking at the door. However, Jonah isn't there anymore. Unknown to them, he's bound in an unknown location. The Breakspears learn about his abduction. Piety is horrified, but her husband insists that there's nothing they can do but wait for the abductors to ask for a ransom. He assures her that their son won't be harmed as long as they pay. Once they get Jonah back, he promises to find and punish whoever is responsible. Later at the park, Imogen walks with Vignette. When they hear thunder, she asks Vignette for her parasol, but the fairy forgot to bring it, so she hurries to fetch it. It starts raining, so Imogen asks to share a parasol with other humans, but they ignore her. To her surprise, Agreus is there, offering his umbrella. With no choice, she stands with him. Agreus mentions that he knows the humans aren't comfortable with him moving into their neighborhood, so Imogen suggests moving out. The fawn refuses because he likes the crossing and its residents. The lady is offended by his compliment, but Agreus can smell the perfume she wears to attract a groom, though he reveals that her perfume contains urine from a creature known as a tro. He tells her that she shouldn't have bothered, as a man can't resist a lady like her. Appalled, Imogen walks away despite the pouring rain. Elsewhere, Philo learns that his autopsy request on Ashling is denied. He confronts Flute about this, but the magistrate refuses to help as they don't care about dead fairies. Desperate, Philo hires a fawn doctor turned butcher to do the autopsy. They learn that Ashling was around 90 years old and had given birth. Her liver is missing, and her sternum was cut straight, which implies that the killer was strong. That evening, Philo visits his friend, Darius, at Bleakness Keep Prison. He shares about Ashling's death, noting how her voice has haunted him since he heard her in the vinyl. Darius advises him to solve the case so he can move on. Before Philo leaves, Darius tells his friend that he doesn't have to visit daily. However, the inspector notes that he could have been arrested instead of him. Elsewhere, Ezra watches Vignette do her chores. He reminds her that she has to serve them a long time to pay her debt, but he leans in close, offering a quicker way. The man starts touching her, but the fairy refuses. Still, Ezra grabs her, noting that he gambled his family's money for the ship, but all he got out of it is Vignette. He overpowers her, but the fairy slams a plate over his head and runs off. Having heard the commotion, Imogen and Defisa check on Ezra, but he lies that Vignette tried to steal. Vignette seeks refuge at the Tetterby Hotel. She shares that she confronted Philo, but she couldn't hurt him. Instead, she realized that she had already wasted her life on him, so she wants a fresh start. With that in mind, Vignette asks for a job at the brothel. Tourmaline discourages her and suggests that her friend visits the Black Raven, a group of fairy mercenaries and freedom fighters. Meanwhile, the Breakspears worry that the kidnappers haven't sent their demands, so Piety brings in a Haruspex named Aofi who can create potions and predict the future. Absalom refuses to use such things, but Piety reminds him that her family has used Haruspexes for generations, and Aofi was the one who brought them together. With that, Aofi uses the family's pet bear for the ritual. She then predicts that Jonah's abductor is someone who wants to take the Chancellor's position, so they assume that it's Longerbane. Later, Vignette goes to the Black Raven's assembly and witnesses the leader, Dahlia, punishing a member who was caught by the police, but won't tell what she divulged to the authorities. The woman notes that humans bind fairies' wings so that they'll be afraid of falling like them. Proving her point, she binds her members' wings and throws her off the balcony. Dahlia believes that fairies who protect humans over their own belong to the ground. Vignette assures her that she's loyal to her kind. To prove her worth, Dahlia orders the newcomer to steal the flag at the constable station. The next day, Philo overhears the Spurn Roses reporting Vignette. Worried, he later offers to pay for Vignette's debts, hoping to convince them to grant her freedom. Ezra quickly agrees to this, much to his sister's surprise. After Imogen walks out, the inspector asks why Vignette escaped, certain that she wouldn't have stolen anything. When the man doesn't explain, Philo deduces what really happened. Later, Ezra confesses to his sister that they're financially struggling despite their father's fortune. He defends that maintaining their household and Imogen's lifestyle is expensive, so he has to invest in things. He intends to take up a loan and invest in another ship, defending that the previous shipwreck was bad luck. However, he needs to put the house as collateral, which Imogen is vehemently against. Ezra points out that Imogen doesn't know anything about business, so only he can make the decisions. At an unknown location, Piety walks around her bound son, whose head is covered in a bag. He spouts out threats, unaware that his own mother had him kidnapped, and instructed Aofi to blame Longerbane. That evening, Imogen watches Agrius arriving home and devises a plan. She writes a letter to apologize to her neighbor, which Afisa later delivers. 
Afterward, Afis assures that Agrius invites her lady to tea tomorrow, thus setting Imogen's plan in motion. At the station, Philo meets with Amima, who demands to see Ashling's body. Mima's are Fae priestesses, so she claims that Ashling's soul cannot rest until she's anointed. After the Mima does her task, she shares that Ashling lit a candle at her shrine every week, though she doesn't know for whom she did so. She then senses that a great unnatural evil took her, so Philo shares how Jack claimed that a dark god lurks in the city. Meanwhile, Tourmaline provides a distraction to allow Vinyat to steal the flag. However, the constables see her, so they chase after her. Philo overhears the commotion and tracks her down, deducing that she's joined the Ravens. He warns that she'll be arrested, though she threatens to tell the police about their past. This makes Philo hesitate long enough to let her go, allowing Vinyat to begin her life on the opposite side of the law. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.